Hello and welcome to the programme. My guest today is Sir John Soares, the former head of Britain's secret intelligence service. He was the chief of MI6 from 2009 to 2014, a period marked by great turmoil in the Middle East, the Arab Spring, the war in Syria and the rise of the Islamic State group. Before that, from 1999 to 2001, he was foreign policy advisor to Tony Blair and he dealt with Vladimir Putin when there was still cautious talk about a possible new security partnership between Russia and the West. Well, that now seems like ancient history as the growing crisis over Ukraine amply shows. Uh, Sir John Sauls joins me from the UK. Uh, Sir John, thank you so much for being my guest. Uh, let's start with these latest warnings uh, from the United States about an imminent attack. Uh, when you hear those warnings, does it sound to you as though they're based on a very specific piece of intelligence or more of a broad picture? Well, Armand, um, thank you for having me on the program. Um, I do think that the situation in the east of Europe, in Ukraine, is extremely dangerous at the moment. The Russians have pulled together a, uh, a, a set of armed forces which has everything needed in order to launch uh, a military incursion, possibly a full invasion uh, of Ukraine. He doesn't have just the tanks and, uh, uh, and armored vehicles and, and planes. He has all the, all the logistics, the engineering, the field hospitals and so on in place. So, and he's also created a pretext for doing so, this alleged um, attacks on, uh, uh, on uh, ethnic Russians in East Ukraine uh, uh, and the breaches of the ceasefire there. Uh, but, but I'm not yet sure that the, the road to diplomacy has come to an end. We will see during the course of this week whether uh, uh, President Putin takes up the uh, opportunity of a summit meeting with President Biden. It sounds, uh, we're speaking on Monday morning, it sounds as though the, uh, uh, the, the initial signs are one of hesitancy in, in Moscow. But I don't think the scope for uh, diplomacy is completely run dry, but the, omen the, the omens are pretty, are pretty poor at the moment in East Ukraine. It's obviously hard to, to speculate on these things, but uh, I mean, based on your experience, uh, which, which scenario do you think is unfolding now? There have been many different possible scenarios that have been uh, sketched out in terms of Russia's intentions towards Ukraine. Do you think there's one particularly obvious one that is emerging as we speak, or is it still too early to say? I think it's still a bit too early to say. I think the Western assessment led by the Americans has been of a large scale invasion. I think that is one of a number of military options that Putin has. If, frankly, if I was advising President Putin what was in his interest, if he's determined on some form of incursion, then I would urge him to, uh, to limit it to the east of Ukraine, uh, where he has these two puppet statelets in uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, uh, which he could either incorporate into Russia or he could recognize as independent um, as states and undermine uh, Ukraine that way. But the larger scale option of a full invasion of uh, Ukraine, the uh, uh, taking over the capital city, Kiev, the uh, uh, toppling of the government and installing a puppet regime, there's no doubt that the Russians have the capability to do that, but I think that would then be the beginning of their problems. They would face a concerted response and resistance from the Ukrainian people, um, and I think they would be encouraged, frankly, by the West, as we encouraged the uh, Mujahideen in, in Afghanistan when the Soviet Union invaded that country back in, the, uh, back in 1980. So I, I think Putin, by nature, is he's a calculated risk taker, but he's not incautious. He's not reckless. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and so uh, I see some scope for him uh, uh, taking a lesser military option. But frankly, no one knows what's going through the President Putin's mind. No, I mean, that's the key thing. It's it's a war of nerves, isn't it? But um, just a, a quick point about the, the nature of intelligence. It does seem to have changed, hasn't it, uh, from, uh, say, 2014, when the, the little green men appeared in Crimea. What we're seeing this time is a lot of open source material that anyone can see on TikTok, Twitter, and so forth with different kinds of uh, Russian vehicles. Uh, uh, what, what anyone can see what sort of 
anti-aircraft uh, equipment they've had fitted on top of them. Uh, th this kind of open source uh, change, if you will, um, who, do you think anyone benefits from that particularly or, or not? I think it does help um, convey uh, internationally the scale of the threat that's being posed. It's not just on secret intelligence. And of course, that acquired a bit of a uh, a bad name in uh, in the Iraq conflict almost 20 years ago, or so ago. Um, this is very much material that's open. We're seeing satellite pictures uh, on our news screens, on our newspapers, um, and we can see the scale of the build-up. And I think also um, uh, the, uh, uh, the the narrative uh, of um, uh, uh, well-informed by intelligence that the United States has put out of uh, Russian uh, uh, threats to install a puppet government, to create a pretext by false flag operations uh, in the East. Um, the, the latest information to come out is of a, an alleged kill list uh, of, of Ukrainians and, and others in Ukraine that the uh, Russians are determined to take out during any operation. I think all these, um, it's a good way of stealing the narrative mm. from um, uh, from Putin, and it's well, based on well-informed assessments. Uh, the, all these assessments, do they point to better human intelligence as well than was the case maybe, I don't know, let's say in 2009 when, when you took over? How do you think that has evolved? Well, Western intelligence agencies always had Russia as a major uh, intelligence target. I'm not going to go into sources and methods of intelligence collection, but human sources are a vital uh, uh, complement to the technical and uh, uh, satellite and signals intelligence coverage that you can get. It's only through human intelligence that you can have a sense of the intent, of the purpose of the moves that are being made. Uh, you can intercept the um, communications between various sort of uh, troops in the field or field commanders, but that doesn't tell you what the intent of the leadership is and that's the hardest thing to get and only human sources can provide that yeah um let, let's move on a little bit to the, the the whole cyber issue because obviously ukraine has been reporting these massive uh, cyber attacks in the last few days how do you assess ukraine's uh, how it's handling those and i suppose as an extension to that how ready is the eu for more cyber warfare? Because obviously, if we're talking about a doomsday scenario of actual war, the EU will impose sanctions on Russia. Russia will respond to those sanctions. Part of that response will be cyber as well. Well, I well, mean, um, this is the whole new dimension of warfare that's developed over the last uh, 20 years or so. <clears throat> and the Russians have been perhaps the most adept and aggressive users of cyber uh, in situations of conflict. Uh, they used it in Georgia in 2008. They used it again in, um, in Ukraine in 2014. And they've used it consistently, uh, both as a state uh, source of attack. We saw the solar winds attack a year ago, led by the, um, uh, the uh, Russian External Intelligence Agency. We've seen the, the GRU, the military agency, use attacks uh, using cyber um, uh, uh, extensively in Western Europe. <clears throat> and we've seen criminal groups given house room in, in Russia by the uh, uh, by, the Russian state launching attacks and ransomware and uh, uh, and so on that we've seen frequently in the last um, in the last year or so. So I think the European Union <clears throat> and the West generally needs to raise its game on cyber and on national security. Yeah, that that and, would be a big point, I think. Yeah, on that question of ra raising the game, uh, just to quote to you something that the. Uh, Chairman of the Munich Security Conference, uh, Wolfgang Ischinger, said, this is in a piece to Politico, he said uh, a few weeks ago, several countries, including China, proudly publicize that they're already integrating security into their wider tech and data policy making. The EU must follow suit. Uh, perhaps not an entirely comfortable uh, proposition, is it? He's basically saying the EU should become more like China in some ways. Well, I, I wouldn't say that. I think what we've got to do is develop a, a recognition of the importance of security, both individual security and national security, when we develop new regulations. Mm. Now, the European Union is a very powerful regulatory body. We saw it with the GDPR, the regulation on data protection um, and data privacy. Uh, and it's passing now a, a new law, the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act, which promote 
competition and arguably just does so at the risk of security. Now, what the European Union is very strong at is promoting competition, promoting economic interest. It needs to develop much more of a skill of building uh, security, both personal security and national security, into the regulations it develops. And I don't think it's quite done that yet on the Digital Markets Act. Well, that's a whole new field that uh, would be interesting to explore, but unfortunately we'll have to leave it there. But thank you so much for being our guest on the interview, uh, Sir John Soares, former head of Britain's Secret Intelligence Service. That's all. And, of course, do stay tuned. More news, including the latest developments on Ukraine, coming up here on France 24.